Hi everyone, uh, welcome back to the eighth Harvard International Arbitration Conference. Uh, we're now at panel three, taking of evidence in international arbitration mix of traditions. Uh, let me very briefly introduce the speakers of this panel. Uh, so our first speaker here is uh, Patricia Saiz. She's an arbitrator, a faculty member of SI Law School and at the MITS and member of the ICC International Court of Arbitration on behalf of Spain. She is also an officer of the IBA Arbitration Committee of Diversity and Inclusion. Uh, before becoming an arbitrator, Professor Saiz practiced as counsel in the US for more than 10 years, and she is trained both in common law, indeed, she is a 2003 Harvard Law School alumni and in civil law, SI Law School in Barcelona. She is admitted to practice in New York, DC, and in Spain as well. Uh, our second speaker here is Mr. James Hosking. He is the co-founder of Chaffetz Lindsay in New York and the head of the International Arbitration Group. Over the last 25, 25 years, uh, he has represented clients in more than 1,000 arbitrations and has sat in around 45 cases acting as an arbitrator himself. Uh, Mr. Hosking's ex exper expertise is acknowledged by all major directories, and recently he was elected to a ICA governing board and as co-chair of the New York International Arbitration Center's Publications Committee. He's an adjunct professor at NYU uh, law School and co-author of A Guide to the ICR International Arbitration Rules. And he also, as Patricia, earned his LM from Harvard Law School. Finally, we have Ari McKinnon. He is the co-chair of Cleary Gottlieb's Global International Arbitration Practice, as well as the chair of the LATAM International Arbitration Practice. Mr. Ma Mr. McKinnon has been recognized as banded lawyer for or international arbitration by Chambers Latin America and Chambers Global. Latinvex has recently named Mr. McKinnon uh, one of Latin America's rising legal stars. He is a member of the board of directors and program committee of the New York International Arbitration Center, the Charter Institute of Arbitrators and the International Arbitration Club of New York. Mr. McKinnon has ample experience in both common law and civil law governed arbitrations with a specific focus on Latin America, where he conducts arbitrations both in English and in Spanish. So without further ado, uh, Ari, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Sebastian. Um, and thanks to all of you who are here with us today. Uh, we're grateful to Harvard to have the opportunity to participate uh, in this International Arbitration Conference. Um, it's a wonderful event. Um, and as you've just heard from Sebastian, uh, setting aside myself, we have a wonderful panel uh, for you today to talk about the issue of uh, the taking of evidence in international arbitration. Now, although we're all lawyers and we've all spent years studying the minutia of technical legal issues, and we love it, what's, what makes us lawyers, I found that in my practice, International arbitrations often turn on the facts at least as much as they turn on the law. And you may have heard this, it's a common refrain in international arbitration that effective advocacy often requires good storytelling. And the facts are of course, key elements of, of any good story. Significantly for present purposes, it, it is in part through the taking of evidence that international arbitration practitioners uh, obtain the facts. Now, as all of you know, there are different approaches to taking evidence in different legal traditions. Traditionally, practitioners and commentators have divided, maybe overly simplistically, these approaches into the, the common law, or what I would call crazy approach on the one hand, of which I am a practitioner, 
and the civil law approach uh, on the other. But international arbitrations frequently bring, bring together parties, counsel, and arbitrators that hail from countries that may follow the common law tradition and other countries that may follow the civil law tradition. So some of the kind of vexing issues that confront the taking of evidence in international arbitration is include how to address, how to bridge the gap, if there is one, between the common law and civil law traditions. Among those questions, questions that I've thought of, um, thought about, and I'm sure many of you have as well, is, is it fair to say in the present day that there's really a common law approach to the taking of evidence in international arbitration and a different civil law approach? Or are we effectively seeing a, a synthesis or some sort of a uh, combination of those two approaches emerging in the international uh, in international arbitration uh, practice. Uh, these are questions to which I don't have the answer, but fortunately we have with us today two experts who I'm sure do have the answers. And so without further ado, what I would like to, to do is to turn things over to Patricia, uh, who I is going to address the issue of the taking of documentary evidence and to tee this up for you, Patricia, as, as someone who have, we've, heard, we've heard from Sebastian is admitted to practice and has practiced in common law and civil law jurisdictions, I think you can offer us a very interesting perspective on the question of the taking of, of evidence. And I'd be curious to understand your views on whether international arbitration practice, including as reflected, reflected in the IBA guidelines on the taking of evidence, uh, reflects a synthesis of common law and civil law traditions or whether you continue to see two separate strands of practice a common law strand and a civil law strand and maybe along with that it'd be great to get your views on how arbitrators in in practice deal with bad behavior uh with so-called guerrilla tactics in which none of us on this uh particular in this particular conference would ever participate uh but it'd be great to get your views and so I'll turn it over to you, Patricia. Well, thank you so much, um, Ari, and um, thanks uh, to Harvard for, for the invitation. Um, it's a pleasure to be here uh, today and share the floor uh, with James and with Ari. And James, I don't know that I have the answers, but I'm going to try at least to have some thoughts on these issues, and, and hopefully we'll all leave with some food for thought for tonight, at least, um, arising from, from, from this presentation. So I thought I would start, you, you're raising such good questions, and I thought I would start with uh, just laying out the, the, the groundwork for, let me see, um, I'm not sure if you're seeing my presentation already. There you are. Great, so the first thing is, as, as you all uh, manifested, uh, it is well known there's this gap between how evidence is presented in civil law uh, jurisdictions versus common law jurisdictions. You were raising a question as to whether the gap was actually this large. I think we're going to answer pretty um, conclusively that, the, the, that um, the answer to that is yes. I want to go over some of the basic traits, and I'll be very quick. Obviously, this is a simplification, but... Um, but it, it's helpful because it, it, it helps set the framework for everything we're gonna discuss afterwards when we start focusing on document production issues. So just to be um, uh, very succinct, in common law, we're looking at a system where the judge is acting as a referee in pretty much what is a duel between the two parties. In search for an absolute truth, the judge is passive, and the case management is pretty much in the party's hands. And the system relies very heavily on oral testimony. And it requires, and this is the important piece that we're going to focus on a lot, disclosure of both supportive documents and also adverse documents. Moving on to the civil law side, we have a system where the judge is responsible for identifying and applying the law to the facts that are proven by the parties. And the search is not for the absolute truth, but the relative truth. The case management is conducted by the judge and the system relies heavily on documentary evidence. And the most important piece is that each party makes its case in reliance of evidence that is already in its possession. Um, 
And so document requests are only admissible in very exceptional circumstances. And I want to focus on that again. So to me, one of the main differences having practiced in both kinds of systems is the amount of evidence that one may be able to obtain after the proceedings have begun that were not in your possession by the beginning of the by the time the, the proceedings be, uh, began. So in civil law jurisdictions, uh, parties and their counsel are making their case with the evidence that's in their hands. In common law jurisdictions, parties are preparing to be able to reach into a pool of documents that are in the hands of opposing party, into a pool of, of characters, of people, uh, employees, uh, executives that are not under their control. And so to me, the main difference is precisely this, is, is understanding that the um, how much evidence you can obtain in one system versus another, which is going to inform how parties behave in arbitration. So in arbitration, the, what makes this really interesting is that we're all coming together under one procedural umbrella, but all of us are bringing our cultural legal backgrounds, as well as a set of expectations as to how things should be done. And as you all know, in arbitration, the common law approach informs the conduct of the proceedings, but to a certain extent with some limitations and of course, not without controversy as, as we will see. And that has culminated in the creation of soft law that is trying to reconcile the two approaches to how documentary evidence and other kinds of evidence is to be presented. So that takes me to the IBA rules on the taking of evidence. The latest version is from 2020. We're looking at non-binding rules. And I'm here, I'm reading from the preamble to provide efficient, economic, and fair process for the taking of evidence. They were first issued in 99. They were amended in 2010 and then in 2020. And they apply in commercial and investor state arbitrations, and they really reflect procedures from different legal systems. Um, and obviously, they're useful for when parties come from different legal cultures. And of course, that again is not without controversy, and I'll, I'll um, delve into that um, in, a, in a second. So, when we look at document production requests, they're really becoming the norm in international arbitration. That that's what we're seeing, both in uh, cases where all parties are common law and their counsel are common law, but also in cases where uh, we're looking at um, civil law parties and counsel. And um, the IBA, interestingly, there's the, the, the well-known criticism that it has Americanized international arbitration. Um, I, want, I want to hold that thought for a moment until we're done looking at this so that we, we think about this a little bit more, because uh, when we're looking at um, the extent of discovery in the common law system, where, again, you have access to um, all kinds of documents, you have access to um, the other side's employees and executives, you, you do depositions. Uh, this is, this, uh, the IBA guidelines really do not provide for depositions and provide for some form of document production to a certain extent. And we're going to see that there's actually a bit of discrepancy as to how far document production may go. So I wanted to bring up um, Article 3 because, to me, this is where a lot of the troubles begin. When we look at Article 3, and it tells us that um, within the time ordered by the tribunal, any party may submit to the arbitral tribunal and to the other parties a request to produce. And then it goes on to say a request to produce may include, may contain, a, a description of each requested document sufficient to identify it, no issues here, but also, to little i, a description in sufficient detail of a narrow and specific requested category of documents that are reasonably believed to exist. And of course, needless to say, we all have very different views as to what constitutes a narrow and specific category of documents. If you are a German um, arbitrator with a German background, you may have a very uh, specific view as to what narrow and specific means. If you're a New York arbitrator and you're used to uh, very extensive discovery in your day-to-day -day practice as a litigator in local courts, you're going to have a very different view as to what narrow and specific really means. So even within the common grounds that are facilitated by the, by the IBA guidelines, my, in my experience, 
everyone has still different views as to what constitutes an appropriate amount of document production coming under the, the, the terms as to what is narrow and specific. In practice, what I have found is that in arbitrations where all parties are common law parties and counsel um, also are common law, that we do have an extensive amount of document production. Uh, obviously not, not uh, as close as what we would see in, in US local courts, but still a significant amount of document production where all parties are common law parties, uh, are civil law parties, sorry. Um, it varies. I've seen, um, well, first of all, I've seen civil law parties that are just not well-versed in um, document production and how it works. Civil law parties that are very, uh, that are practicing in international arbitration and that have become very proficient in the use of, of document production requests. And some of them will use it. Some of, uh, some of the parties won't. Others kind of try it out. And my advice is careful because when you decide to try it out, you are committing your, your client to a process that can be um, not only cumbersome, but also unexpected for, for the client when it finds that it has to turn over documents that may not shed a good light on their case. And then the last piece is, and that this to me is the most controversial, is when you have Parties coming from one party comes from a common law country, another one comes from a civil law country, and then my concern there is the kinds of asymmetries that that we may encounter when one party is used to litigating in local courts, is used to the exercise of document production, and the other party has never seen it. So one party is um, has teams in place, and not only has teams in, in place, has strategies in place to preserve privilege. For example making sure that um, there's a lawyer copied on all emails, making sure that a legal question is asked, making sure that every document is labeled as privi privileged and confidential. And a civil law party may not just be ready for this at all, and then may have to find itself um, having agreed to the use of the IBA um, guidelines, again, turning over documents that they're not comfortable with turning over and that they never expected they would have to turn over. So, so this is an, a, an issue in my view. Um, in any event, uh, as a result of the gravitational pull of the IBA guidelines and the fact that some uh, practitioners thought it was very Americanized, again, I before I move on to the next point, whether it's Amer Americanized or not, in my view, uh, it seems like when I speak to civil law lawyers, they found the document production exercise very taxing under the IBA guidelines. When I speak to common law lawyers, they find they don't have pretty much the tools that they have in local courts. So ultimately, when everyone's complaining, it makes me wonder if if probably this is actually finding some, some middle ground. But um, as I was saying before, because of the gravitational pull of the IBA guidelines, a task force put together the um the what what is known as the the prag rules the the rules on the efficient conduct of proceedings in international arbitration as a counterpoint to the iba guidelines and what we're really looking is um is a a set of rules which is much more geared to the civil law approach uh as to how um evidence is collected uh, a set of rules that gives a lot more of a visible role to the judge uh, the judge actually has a very proactive role in, in the gathering of, um, of, of evidence and establishing the facts. It also establishes that uh, judges know the law, and so you don't know curia, so there's no, that there wouldn't be discussions with respect to that. It provides that tribunals may uh, help with uh, parties reaching a settlement agreement. And Going back to the issue of document production, it actually discourages any form of document production. It, and it provides that only in exceptional circumstances, parties may request for specific documents, but they have to have announced it at the case management conference. Um, so we're looking at a very, very different approach. I personally have not had a case yet where I've seen the Prague rules in place. They're relatively recent, so I'm wondering if Parties are starting to 
perhaps you put them in their contracts and I've just not have not seen controversies arising out of contracts uh, in, that included the Prague rules or any uh, tribunals ordering them. Um, but I think it's a, it's a wait and see approach at this point to see how much success they're going to have. Another interesting aspect to the document production exercise is the fact that this is breeding grounds for what we call guerrilla tactics. The uh, parties are under the IBA guidelines and under um, many different sets of rules are to act in good faith. But as we all know, even though no one here, no one in this conference has ever done this, um, parties tend to engage in guerrilla tactics that are designed to delay, perhaps, and also obstruct the proceedings. And one way to do this with document production requests is by engaging in a fishing expedition, for example, um, or responding to document production requests that are made by the other side by producing thousands and thousands of documents and trying to um, bury the incriminating, ev the incriminating evidence uh, in an overwhelming amount of documents. So the IBA rules lend themselves, or actually any time that, that um, some form of document production is allowed, it lends itself to potential misuse. I wanted to show an image. This is an image from the movie uh, Dark Waters. I don't know if anyone in the audience has, has seen this. It's about this um, guy at a law firm that takes on a case um, against a chemical uh, company. And his firm is not very keen on him taking the case, but he does anyway. And so very the very um, uh, well-equipped lawyers from the other side send him uh, overwhelming amount of, of documents, uh, obviously, in the with with the aim of hiding the smoking gun, which he ultimately ends up finding in the movie. So I just wanted to show that to see because probably most people in the audience have seen this. I don't know if we have a lot of civil law lawyers, but we all see it in movies when boxes come in to law firms or when people are buried in conference rooms uh, dealing with dealing with hundreds and hundreds of boxes. So that's the product of a very extensive exercise in, in document production. How do we um, counter that as arbitrators? Well, there's a number of things that, that arbitrators can do. And it may be advisable to um, issue a document production uh, procedural order with, and I'm just gonna suggest a number of things that I've seen. This is a, um, I've also seen this in a model that is used by a very renowned uh, Spanish arbitrator, um, where one of the proposals is, well, maybe the party should be invited to limit the number of requests that they may do, number one. Number two, when it comes to uh, narrow and specific categories of documents, um, to lay out in the procedural order exactly what is meant by narrow and specific. So do you have to identify who the issuer is? Do you have to identify the time frame very, very carefully? Do you have to give evidence of the putative existence of the category of documents that is being requested, for example, and then to lay out that any documents that do not comply, any requests that do not comply with these instructions will be rejected in limine, so that parties know what they are supposed to do. In the model that I've seen, um, the uh, there are also examples as to things that would be rejected. And to give, to, to give you an example, something like which is something I've seen very in many different cases, all documents and any correspondence exchanged internally or externally between the claimant and any of the entities in its group structure in relation to the construction of X. Okay, so this is something that would not fit the, the, the requirement of being narrow and specific. You can also tie down what is supposed to be relevant. So for example, asking the parties to identify the paragraphs in their submissions uh, for which the evidentiary evidence support is required. Uh, so all of these are, are different tools. And of course, one that always works <laughs> because money talks, as they say, is to provide that there will be a um, decision on costs where the tribunal may make a special allocation with respect to a document production exercise where it will take into account the reasonableness of the requests and the objections, the willingness of the party to produce documents, and the relative successes of each party. And that might be a deterrent to certain kinds of, of behavior that we often see 
in arbitration. Um, moving on to the last topic, really, uh, is the fact that in uh, arbitration, as we all know, arbitrators do not have coercive powers, so we cannot force the parties to produce. So what happens then, I get asked this question quite often, what happens then in the event of non-compliance? What are the consequences for failure to comply? And here there are a number of options. I'll go from, and there's really no order, but the, 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 the obvious one is, well, maybe the tribunal will then treat future evidence with a degree of skepticism if the party has uh, ordered, um, if the tribunal has ordered a party to produce something and the party has just uh, f flat out rejected uh, the order without um, a satisfactory explanation. We could also do adverse inferences, which I'm going to focus on in a moment. And um, we can also um, use costs as a deterrent. So if a, uh, a party does not comply with an order from the tribunal, query as to whether the tribunal may then want to sanction that party by imposing a higher amount in, of costs or higher percentage of costs than it would have otherwise um, done. Turning to the issue of adverse inferences, which I find quite fascinating, the IBA guidelines in Article 9.6 tell us that if a party fails without satisfactory explanation, and here again, what is satisfactory explanation? It's a good question. To produce any document requested in a request uh, to produce to which it has not objected in due time, then the arbitral tribunal may infer that such document would be adverse to the interests of that party. Well, a question also as to what adverse means, but um, there are times when the tribunal has made an order, the party has refused to comply with the tribunal's order, and then the counterparty says, Tribunal, you should make this inference. The first question that should come to mind is, is the content of the inference, does it directly correlate to the non-produced document? And I've had this, uh, I've seen this in my cases where the, um, the content of the inference that one party is, uh, is asking for is tangentially related to the document that, it, that has been requested, but doesn't go exactly to the point of the document. And so um, that is the first item that needs to be checked by a tribunal. The second is, well, is the non, is, is the uh, lack, is the non-compliance, is there, is it binary or is it non-binary in the sense of, can I, is it a yes or no? Is it, it, can I just say, well, the lack of uh, production, it, I'm going to infer A or B, or are there other options as to things that I could infer? And it's actually A, B, C, D, E, and all in different degrees of um, uh, how, as to how damaging they are. Just to give you an example, let's say that a uh, Tribunal has requested a party to produce board meetings, and in the board meetings, there's an acknowledgement of debt. The counterparty is saying, I want you to infer from these board meetings that the debt that was acknowledged is in the amount of 100 million and to be paid in these terms. So sometimes parties go much further asking for inference, adverse inferences that contain an amount of detail that may not necessarily be. Uh, susceptible of of um, of an inference because it again the inference is non non binary in that case. And then my last point is, well, okay, um, we're we are in a position to make an adverse inference. The adverse inference correlates directly with the the content of the document. It's it's binary or at least um, I'm comfortable that it's of many different options. Perhaps I've, I've seen counsel do this before and say which one is the least damaging, at least tribunal take this option as the adverse inference. Well then, what can the arbitrator do with that? And can, can an arbitrator rule solely on the basis of an adverse inference? And here the question is not a question of admissibility, it's a question of the weight that the arbitrator should give to that piece of evidence. And an adverse inference is not direct evidence, it's indirect or circumstantial evidence, and therefore, the question there, the most important question is, is this P 
piece of circumstantial evidence enough to discharge for the party to discharge the burden of proof? Obviously, that's a question that is the the answer to that is based on facts and circumstances. There may be instances where, without any other um, circumstantial evidence on the record, that may be enough. Tribunals tend to solely on the basis of an adverse inference. I have not seen tribunals typically go ahead and assume that the adverse inference itself in the absence of corroborating evidence on, in, on, on record, on the file. So that's something to keep in mind. What would be enough to, to discharge the burden of proof? I was faced with an issue uh, like this uh, not that long ago, and then different standards will apply. The adjudicators have to figure out, is this adverse inference enough to make me, let's say we're in a jurisdiction where the standard is having the intimate conviction that something happened, or if it's a balance of probabilities, is that piece of circumstantial evidence enough to get you over the threshold? And that's, like I said, that's a question of weight, not a question of admissibility. And it's something that arbitrators must do, not go straight into making the adverse inference, but rather or actually making the adverse inference, but giving the adverse inference the appropriate way. And then the last point is that, of course, due process is extremely important. And the party against whom the adverse inference is being made should have an opportunity to make any allegations um, it deems appropriate. Again, in general, in my view, tribunals are not inclined to, to deem a fact as proven on the basis of an adverse inference alone. And so with that, that takes me to the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. And I look forward to um, any questions that you may have. Thank you, Patricia. Thank you very much. That was a great presentation. I have to say, the picture you showed of that room full of boxes brought me back to my days as an associate. It's also a recurring nightmare that I have uh, waking up in a room such as that. So um, I don't thank you for that, Patricia. <laughs> Now, I'd like to maybe turn it to you, James, and I'm curious to see if you have any reactions to Patricia's presentation. And maybe one thing I can tee up for you is the question as to what your experience has been with issues arising from a party's non-production of documents. Uh, th thanks, Ari, and, um, uh, and thank you uh, to, uh, to to Harvard, to, to uh, Karim and, and Sebastian for the invitation to speak. Uh, I too have uh, nightmare memories of being in that same room, possibly a different room than you, Ari, but uh, maybe we can get a, a group discount on, on therapy for our, our associate memories. Um, so, so yeah, let me quickly make a couple of comments on um, on yeah the a party's non-production of, of documents. Um, it's interesting. I agree completely with Patricia. Uh, adverse inferences are tricky. Uh, in my experience, they are hard to craft in a way that really addresses the non-production, and it's very rare for them to result in either an affirmative factual finding or a finding of liability. Uh, and so um, I find them a very blunt instrument um, to, to deal with that particular problem. The, the other remedies that you mentioned, uh, Patricia, are more common in my experience. Costs, if you really can tie it to the non-production in some way that, that, that can be quantified. Um, one you didn't mention, but is, is sort of obvious, is timetable impact. So if you do come up with an argument you've been prejudiced by the non-production um, and you of a document and you have subsequently found some document or some source of material, um, then, then the tribunal may try and address the issue by um, curing the prejudice by, by giving you some, some timetable advantage, which, which is another way of, of addressing it. Um, uh, um, and, and I guess, but the real, the real penalty uh, is, and, and what keeps the system honest, is that if you are found to actually have had a document and not produced it, then the credibility impact is obviously, uh, you know, very extreme. That's the real big stick that keeps the keeps the system honest. And one observation I'd make in that respect, more wearing my arbitrator hat now, is that parties have become a lot more aggressive in making uh, claims of non-production as the technology around document analysis and artificial intelligence and and uh, data review has become more advanced. And so you can do these deep dives into the into the web or uh, looking through social media or you know using software applications to produce a chronology which shows gaps where there should be documents 
those sorts of tools have led to more of these sorts of applications. And, and I think um, it's an area where the sort of mutually assured destruction that and, uh, makes sure, quite apart from rules of professional responsibility, that the lawyers do their utmost to make sure that, that uh, production is made properly. Um, so th those are a few reflections. Thanks very much, James. I appreciate it. So maybe now I'd, I'd like to change topics to talk about some issues relating to the taking of expert evidence or to expert evidence and turn to you, James. And as, as we all know, expert evidence often plays a key role in the resolution of international arbitrations, or at least we think so because we always use experts in our international arbitrations. Keeping with some of the themes that Patricia has touched upon, I'd like to get your views on the extent to which the standards and expert evidence represent sort of a mix of common law and civil law traditions. And I'd also be interested in hearing your thoughts on recent initiatives uh, we've seen to improve the handling of, of expert evidence and, and perhaps on the impact of remote hearings on the presentation of, of, of such evidence. And I think, I think, James, I told you 250, but we're fine to go through 255. Okay. <laughs> I'll turn the floor over to you. Thanks, James. Um, so thanks, Ari. Um, and I, I do have a presentation, which I, I think the, the moderators will put up now. Um, so I, I don't have, I'm afraid I don't have any of the answers to the existential questions that you, you started off the session with, Ari, in terms of um, uh, the, 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 the uh, divide between common law and civil law. And, and if we're looking at synergies or, or, or something else, um, I will say that um, at picking up on something Patricia said, with respect to expert evidence, I think it is an issue in which the, the standards that commonly are applied or the best practices have just enough of an influence from the common law and civil law world to keep everyone unhappy. Um, uh, and so in that respect, you can, you can say, do we need to change anything? And my submission today is that yes, Yes, we should change things, although looking at it from a common law versus civil law uh, prism may ultimately not be the, the best way of trying to make those changes. Um, so if I can go to the next slide, uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit now about some of the, the transnational standards. Um, and Patricia has already set this up by introducing the IBA rules and the Prague rules. Um, with respect to the IBA rules, um, you know, they, they seek to strike a balance between uh, expectations of common law and civil law practitioners. They are neutral as to whether to use a, a party appointed expert or a tribunal appointed expert. Um, they provide a very sort of high level broad brush framework for each of those two scenarios. And they provide some basic rules for appointment of experts, minimum standards for reports, um, and an expectation that the expert will be presented at the hearing with a presumption, at least, about uh, the possibility of cross-examination. So you can say that they may reflect more of a common law influence, but they're certainly a long way from what a U.S. litigator would expect to see with respect to expert evidence. Um, for example, the absence of depositions and um, some of the other aspects of U.S. litigation around expert testimony, including broader scope for impeachment, tighter rules on qualification, those kind of things. Um, now, the Prague rules, uh, as Patricia said, were sort of set up to, um, as they say in the introduction, to, um, uh, to, to address a perceived uh, imbalance uh, in being too uh, common law oriented. The main differences to the IBA rules with respect to experts uh, are that there is a presumption that if there is to be expert evidence, um, then it will be a tribunal appointed expert, although it does not preclude the possibility of there being party appointed experts as well. Um, I think most importantly, there is a very strong influence in the Prague rules for a more proactive um, management of the case by the tribunal. I'm going to come back to that in a second. Um, and there's no presumption of, of, of cross-examination. Um, and, 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 and as the rules say, this is more consistent with a, an inquisitorial uh, approach. Um, uh, now, those sort of competing versions of the transnational rules have been uh, have been added to um, uh, over the you know, over the years, um, and most recently, I've listed at least three um, institutional reports, notes, and protocols that have that have come in uh, into effect. Um, I won't go through those in detail. I'm going to, in a moment, suggest what some of the underlying criticisms of expert evidence are that those notes and protocols are intended to address. Um, but generally speaking, 
all three of those uh, protocols on the board on the on the screen encourage the parties to consider using tribunal appointed experts, uh, proactive case management, early exchanges of expert evidence, uh, seeking to find common ground or common scope of expert evidence. Um, but none of them go so far as to be prescriptive. They really are suggestions as to what may be um, uh, best practices. So let me go to the next slide. Um, and I'm going to suggest here, uh, these are some of the five most common complaints one hears about uh, expert evidence. Um, so so uh, first of all, there's this, should you have a, a, a party appointed expert or, or, a, or, or tribunal appointed expert or both? Um, and in my experience, it, it is in the US at least, most typically party appointed experts only. It is rare that there is a tribunal appointed expert. And, and if you do, then it's usually an addition to the costs and potential delay because it's, it's really um, you know, another layer of expert evidence. But what I'm going to suggest in a moment is that uh, um, you know, we might look to other forms of arbitration where it is more common to have tribunal appointed experts have a much larger role in the proceeding in sports arbitrations where there are doping aspects. For example, it's common practice to have, um, to have a, a tribunal appointed medical uh, officer um, uh, there are other sorts of commodities arbitrations uh, where it's it's typical to have an expert address certain detailed quality issues that may impact a party's claims. Um, and so maybe we can learn from those other sorts of specialized arbitrations. Uh, I'd also suggest, because I'm going to say in a moment, that much of the criticisms of expert evidence come down to the tribunal's unwillingness to really grapple with the detail, or to put it more sympathetically, uh, they get thrown a lot of very complex information very late in the process. Uh, and so one suggestion is that at least in those cases that warrant it, uh, based on, on, on costs um, and complexity, a tribunal-appointed expert may take some of the burden off the tribunal in trying to grapple with the information being provided and narrow down the issues so it can be, be presented more effectively in the final evidentiary hearing. Um, Second bullet point, um, narrowing the scope of disagreements. Uh, you know, we, we, we've all had cases where uh, at great expense, you know, two competing experts are put on and they're like ships passing in the night, uh, apples to oranges, whatever the correct analogy is that you, you want to use. Um, even with the most detailed of, uh, uh, of procedural orders, I, I've had that happen. Uh, and it's frustrating for everyone, uh, uh, the arbitrators, for counsel, it can just be a strategic ploy to try and muddy the waters. Um, sometimes it takes the form of being an overly complex approach to expert evidence. I had a case not long ago where the other side had uh, 10 experts uh, addressing atomized issues, which we addressed on our side uh, with, with three to four experts. Um, or, or similar or, or differently, but at the same point, it can simply be um, different methodological approaches where even though you have the same scope of, of testimony, you've taken such a different approach to it that it, it just doesn't um, doesn't gel. The third point is unnecessary expert evidence. Uh, an example of that would be, uh, you know, do you really need to have the experts on the law? Some cases you do, but there are cases, a lot of cases I've seen where that's that's not necessary. Um, the fourth criticism uh, is to do with a lack of tribunal uh, engagement. Um, and as I said a moment ago, I think much of the uh, inefficiencies come around, uh, come about because of the, the difficult position the arbitrators are in, in trying to process complex information. Um, things like hot tubbing really only work if the, if the uh, tribunal really understands the evidence that's been presented with. And then lastly, sort of a catch-all of techniques for controlling time and costs. Many of the same criticisms that apply to document produ production, as um, Patricia talked about, um, bulky reports, extensive document requests, unwieldy presentations in the actual hearing, those are things which uh, just add to time uh, and costs. Um, so if you go to the next slide, um, th this is where I get to my non-panacea, but some suggestions of what we could do that moves beyond the sort of modest suggestions and the protocols that have come from the institutions. And, and my proposal is that um, having lived through and hopefully now beginning to come out of the COVID pandemic, uh, we're all very happy to be going back finally to in-person hearings. I had my first one this week and uh, for, since two years. Um, uh, but we have learned during the pandemic to deal with remote hearings and to adjust how we present cases. Uh, and I think there are some lessons we can take away from that 
uh, and carry on with in the post-COVID world that can be applied to uh, the expert evidence scenario as well. Um, and so I've got five suggestions uh, on the screen there, which, which I'll talk about a little bit. So first of all, case management conferences. Um, now, even since I guess the, the ICC report on time and costs and the ICC note, there's always been an, uh, an emphasis on the initial case management conference, the need to expand the issues that are addressed in that conference so that the tribunal can um, start a discussion about what the real contours of the arbitration look like. And so I have a discussion of expert evidence on my standard agenda for a case management conference. I will often be presented with uh, the not unreasonable response from the parties that they don't know yet what that will look like. Uh, if that is the answer, then then I think you need to have a follow-up conference uh, sometime later on to make sure that uh, the experts have really engaged on the issues to avoid that ships passing in the night scenario. And in that respect, um, remote hearing technology just makes case management conferences easier. Uh, you know, it, it's just uh, it, it's an easy uh, cost justification to schedule a subsequent conference when you really dig into the expert uh, um, uh, evidence. Uh, at least there is a naming of experts early on or a, uh, a fairly detailed scope of what that expert will address. Um, and the arbitrators should have a hands-on role in that, in my view, rather than simply leaving it to the parties. Um, second point, tribunal-appointed experts. Now, there are lots of concerns people have about tribunal-appointed experts, but one of them, I think, is just a fear of the unknown. So in the few cases where I have had tribunal-appointed experts, we've had to adopt some protocol for identifying the experts, joint interviews or a list of questions that are agreed in advance, um, things like that. Again, remote technology can make that a, a more efficient process. You can have uh, joint interviews of, of potential candidates. You can interface more easily with organizations like the ICC or, or industry-based groups um, that, that specialize in providing experts uh, to, uh, to, to, to dispute resolution proceedings. Um, so again, uh, think about employing those tools to, to make that an option. And then a, a large bullet point here, expert meetings, joint reports, and Kaplan openings. Um, this is all you know, co common, common territory. I'm not suggesting anything new, but video conferencing simply makes these things easier in terms of the expert to expert conferencing, in terms of updating the tribunal on the status of expert issues. Um, uh, um, and even at, at the more extreme end of the scale, a so-called Kaplan opening, which I, I have seen done effectively in big, complex, particularly construction cases, where you have a sort of mini hearing where the parties put on a, a preview of what will come in the evidentiary hearing, but particularly focused on expert issues to make sure that, that they really have joined issue. Um, and here again, uh, video technology can make that easier uh, and cheaper. Uh, so I can see a, a you know a future in which the Kaplan opening is a standard procedure that happens in the cases that warrant it at least, where it's done remotely in advance of an in-person evidentiary hearing. Um, and, and as part of that, I'd also point out that there can be greater use of technology with respect to expert evidence. So something is it could be as simple as using um, you know Google Docs, which you know my kids use for all their collaborative uh, cl classroom homework. Um, doing that using that Google Docs for for producing joint reports or a Scott schedule or those types of um, uh, you know joint efforts between the experts. It can be more complex, like um, uh, agreeing parameters and then using a, a software platform to share those parameters for um, finite element analysis in the engineering world. Um, or, or, or it could be something um, uh, that actually impacts the the hearing itself and how experts present at the hearing. Uh, so, you know, uh, Ari mentioned the need to be good storytellers, uh, and one hopes that experts uh, are part of that storytelling. And I think we have a we've learned during remote hearings and and COVID um, that you can use visual aids to do that in a very effective way. And we're, I think lawyers have been somewhat slow adopters in that respect, but there's more to be done with that with, with expert evidence. And, and lastly, I've just mentioned the role of a uh, potential role for experts after the hearing. Um, I, I think we've all been in cases where, you know, counsel with a sigh of relief, you know, file their post hearing brief and then, you know, sort of, uh, you know, burn their materials and, and wait for the award to come down. Uh, but, 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 you know, the arbitrators are often left with complex issues, often around damages, for example, 
um, where they are being asked to uh, to to, to uh, assess the evidence and apply it in a way to produce the final award. And mistakes can happen, um, or it uh, it uh, encourages conservatism. Um, and and so I think we can think more creatively about producing joint Excel files with, with uh, formulae that allow for particular variables to be decided by the tribunal depending on the liability decisions that are made, to take one easy example, or as we, I think I've seen, and I don't think it's unusual these days, there's an agreement that the tribunal is able to speak jointly to the experts um, prior to issuing the award uh, to ensure that their, um, that their award is consistent with the um, evidence that was presented. So I'll just make a couple of concluding remarks now, and they, they sort of follow from what I've, I've said previously. Um, you know, we're all glad to be uh, returning to in-person hearings now, um, but my suggestion is that uh, um, we should take some of the initiatives for remote hearings and apply them to best practices, to move those best practices forward. Whether you see them as common law practices or civil law practices, it's really about making the arbitral process uh, more efficient um, and avoiding the pitfalls of expert evidence and trying to mitigate some of those criticisms that I, that I listed previously. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll end it there. Thanks, James. That was a very interesting presentation, very refreshing take on how we can try to learn, take some of the lessons learned and move forward with them and to hopefully uh, return to our in-person practice. Um, it, the example you mentioned of the experts perhaps being asked uh, post uh, hearing to get together and, and, and work on an Excel spreadsheet or some sort of damages model. Interesting that you bring that up. I just had um, that happen in uh, a Sao Paulo seated arbitration that we worked on. And although we were initially aghast that the experts were going to be talking to one or one another outside of our presence and the lawyers need to be there, of course, and make our arguments that it, it worked out, I thought, pretty, pretty well. Um, so maybe, uh, Patricia, before we conclude, I, I did want to get your reactions to, to James's presentation, uh, any aspects of it, but one, one particular question that I was hoping to ask you was, was about the practice of your experience with the practice of so-called expert hot tubbing, which uh, I think James mentioned, and whether you have found that practice to be uh, useful in, in your experience. Thanks, uh, thanks, Ari, and, and thanks, James, for the for the uh, for the very useful presentation. And and um, I agree, we need to take some of the lessons that we've learned for the past few years and and apply them and and leave behind the 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 two camps, common law, civil law, and just just move into what's what's really a best practice when it comes to hot tubbing. Um, I I also agree with your statement that it works when the tribunal is engaged. And when the tribunal understands what's being presented um, to them, that of course means the tribunal has done its homework. Um, I find that it's it, the, the, in the cases where I've had it, it has helped to narrow and crystallize the issues. Um, I find that when the experts are uh, interacting with each other, they show um, less bias. They, I think the, the fact that they have a colleague sitting right next to them that can opine right there and contradict them helps contain the sort of the, I'll call it the hired gun effect um, that we see sometimes. No, of course, no one in this uh, presentation, but so, that we sometimes see when they have somebody there to keep them in check. And so um, I think that's that's something that that really works out. Um, the, other, the other aspect that works really well is, uh, and I, you know, going back to the the image that all of us related to, I thought was so painful when we saw the boxes. Uh, when you're preparing for a cross examination with an expert, and somebody tells you, "Oh, you go in, you punch, you get out before you get punched," because it's very hard to cross someone on their area of expertise when it's not yours. How do you engage on uh, the substance of their? report when you're not an expert in LNG, you're not an expert in mining, you're not an expert in whatever it is that's the, the highly technical field. So I have found that having the experts there at the same time, they are better placed to challenge each other's views. And I, it, it turns out I find there are more areas of agreement when I've had hot tubbing 
than what would appear otherwise from their initial reports. So I think overall the exercise helps the adjudicator make better decisions. And I think in the right circumstances, it could be a useful tool to be considered. Excellent. So thanks very much for that, Patricia. James, and I think with, with that, I think this uh, wonderful panel comes to a, to a conclusion. I don't know if I'm happy for Patricia or James, if you have any concluding remarks you'd like to add. Uh, same for you, Sebastian, Karim, but this has been a wonderful joy for me to participate in this panel with, with all of you. I just want to thank uh, Sebastian and Karim for all the work that, that you've put in um, uh, for, the, uh, for the annual conference and uh, to all of the HIELSA team that's also working on this. Uh, good job um, and um, thanks for the invitation again. Uh, it's just to add my, my bit, it's been very impressive that what I've seen so far and there's more to come tomorrow. So uh, congratulations to the HIELSA team. Okay, thank you very much uh, to all of you. This was a truly fantastic uh, panel. Uh, now we're going to have a, a really short 10 minute break and we'll be back in 10 minutes uh, with the final keynote of, of today, uh, Mohamed Solbaya's uh, keynote speech. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Good afternoon or good evening, everyone, and welcome back to the eighth Harvard International Arbitration Conference. Our second co-chair and last co-chair for the day is one of the founding partners of Gaillard Benifatini Shilbaya Disputes, Mr. Mohamed Shilbaya. Mr. Shilbaya is trained in French, English, and Egyptian laws, and is recognized as a leading figure in arbitration with a particular focus on arbitrations in the oil and gas sector. Mr. Shilbaya has represented companies, states, and state-owned entities in more than 60 commercial and investment treaty matters, including many multi-billion dollar disputes involving novel questions of international law and geopolitical issues. Mr. Shibaya also regularly acts as arbitrator in both commercial and investment arbitrations and teaches investment arbitration at Sciences Po Law School in Paris. Today, he will be talking to us about how international arbitration stands between legal cross-pollination and legal acculturation. Mr. Shilbaya, the floor is yours. Good all. Let me first start by thanking the Harvard International Arbitration Law Students Association and Sebastian and Kareem for organizing such a well-structured and substantive conference and for inviting me to participate in it. And uh, let me also thank Arbitration Channel for making this possible despite the obstacles the pandemic has imposed on all of us. Hopefully we get to all meet in person uh, very soon. It's really, truly a pleasure um, to address you on, on the sort of common law, civil law divide um, and, and arbitration's contribution to either making it bigger or, or smaller and we'll sort of address both sides uh, in what I've uh, chosen to call uh, legal cross-pollination and, and, and legal acculturation. So let me get right into it. Um, well, first of all, just some terminology, right? What do I mean by legal cross-pollination and legal uh, acculturation? Um, so cross-pollination, as, as you would know, is a biological sciences concept. It's essentially where pollen from one plant is transferred to the stigma of the flower of another, thereby promoting a biodiversity, genetic diversity, um, and essentially benefiting both. Right? For the purposes of this presentation, legal cross-pollination is where a legal system appropriately and, and harmoniously adopts a process or a concept or procedure uh, from a foreign legal system. And of course, that begs the question of what is harmoniously? <laughs> and, and at least to me, that means two things. On the one hand, it means respecting the purpose and the mechanism that you're importing. So understanding it in its full spectrum and taking it uh, without distorting it. But then also the second part of it, it means when you're importing it, you, that foreign concept, you are making it fit within the fundamental principles of the importing legal order and making it fit with the other processes, concepts and, and procedures that exist within that system. So there is no clash. Now, an example of a harmonious incorporation and therefore of cross-pollination um, is, is how some civil law systems have uh, imported the concept of estoppel from com some common law systems. And, and we'll get to that and other examples. On the other end of the spectrum, you have acculturation. And acculturation, now we're outside of hard sciences and now we're in sort of social sciences. And at least in some of its acceptations, it, it is meant to convey the process that occurs when two cultures inter previously isolated interact, and usually with a negative connotation, because usually the interaction is not, uh, let's call it voluntary. <laughs> it's, it's usually in the advent of like colonization and things like that. But the point is that you get two cultures that clash when they meet rather than, um, rather than incorporate harmoniously. Uh, now, for the purposes of this presentation, legal acculturation occurs when a foreign legal concept is misinterpreted or, mis or inappropriately incorporated by the relevant legal order. 
an example of this, and a quite typical one, is the use of common law concepts such as fraud um, or liquidated damages even in uh, civil law contracts, which happen quite often. And again, we'll get back to it and we'll see more examples. Our general point is that arbitration doesn't cause any of this. It is, it is not the cause of this, either the positive or the negative, the cross-pollination or the acculturation. It's merely a catalyst. And like any catalyst in speeding up the, the process and in, in, in accentuating the process, it sheds, light, it sheds light more clearly on its advantages and its problems. Um, and we'll also see how each time arbitration contributes to that. Now let's start with the positive. Right? So and the positive being the, what I'm calling the cross-pollination in, in international arbitration. Now the cross-pollination can happen in, in well, many ways, but I'm, I chose three to, to, to highlight. One says banal as importing foreign procedures, and, and, and this is something most of us would have seen quite a lot. Uh, more interestingly, it happens when importing substantive concepts from one legal system to another or from one tradition to another. And then finally, that's less importation, but it's rather when each legal system construes concepts that are their own, public policy, uh, approach to contractual construction, in a way that takes into account how other legal systems have approached it. So, so trends toward uniform construction of flexible concepts. If you will. That happens within the New York Convention, but not necessarily sometimes, nothing to do with the New York Convention. So those are the three sort of uh, typical means of legal cross-pollination that I wanted to highlight. So let's start with the first, importing foreign procedures. Again, you would have heard about this a lot, so I'm going to go quite quickly on it. Docking production being, you know, discovery being the, 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 the sort of hypothèse uh, d'école, the, 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 the sort of the stereotype uh, that is usually used to portray this phenomenon, because civil law system either did not know it or had it, but it was not used. It's not true that, it didn't, you know, that doesn't exist. It exists in some forms. It's just a limited in scope and B rarely relied on in, in many civil law systems. But uh, as a result of sort of the cross pollination coming from arbitration, especially, but not just, you have now docking production, of course, being used systematically in, in, in continental or sort of non common law arbitrations where no common law lawyers are involved as arbitrators or as, as counsel um, or English law or any other common law you know, apply, applying to the procedure or to the substance, but parties still, almost regularly, if not systematically, resorting to document production in order to, um, in, in order to, well, benefit from from the uh, from the advantages that it procures both parties in being able to advance their case. Um, more interestingly, not just in arbitrations, but now you have domestic courts in civilian jurisdictions doing the same. So, for example, here you have an example from the Paris Court of Appeal, a decision from April 2018, so not very old, in which the court, on its own motion, uh, was an arbitration case, for that, uh, uh, not unsurprisingly, and, and the court decides to reopen the, the record in order to order parties to produce documents for it to assess corruption allegations that were at stake. Um, so, so this is even more interesting because it, you know, it's easier to import concepts or procedures through arbitration. When it happens through the local courts, it's all the more meaningful. Uh, but again, facilitated, accelerated by, by arbitration. Now, um, uh, other, other ways is just simply the weight you give to some forms of evidence. So written and oral uh, so written, written statements are, are that, again, not unused, unheard of in civil law jurisdictions, but the way that's given to them usually used to be less. And now in continental arbitrations or sort of non-common law arbitrations, you have regular and, and systematic recourse to witness statement, witness evidence, cross-examination in a much more sort of common law style than, than used to be the case, say, 50, 60 years ago. Uh, as a result of, of um, this sort of... Uh, cross-pollination between cultures. Uh, 
conversely, the civil law style pleadings, one sees much rarely, even in purely English law sort of arbitration context, the sort of paragraph-wise rebuttal submission that when you, you know you have an example here, but it, you know it, now it's much more uh, uniform, sort of an arbitration style. One can call it a civil law style pleadings, but that's not necessarily fair. I think it morphed into just something um, of its own, so, so something sort of generous. Uh, but it, that is more civil law than it is common law in, in its style of, of and, and sequencing of pleadings. Now, uh, more interestingly, moving away from procedure, you also have the importing of substantive concepts. And, and I had referred earlier to estoppel, and, and, and I find the estoppel example particularly eliminating. Um, so here you have an, a case from the Egyptian Court of Cassation, it's a recent case from 27 October 2020. And what, what's interesting there is not just the fact that the Egyptian court considered that estoppel to be part of Egyptian law, but how it did so. And, 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 and how it did so is, I think, characteristic of what I would call the difference between cross-pollination and acculturation. We'll get, we'll get to that. But to start the case, and again, showing the relevance of arbitration, the case arose from a party trying to renege on an arbitration agreement that it has signed based on the technicality of it relating to the means by which it signed it. And um, the court says, oh, fine, you may have breached applicable rules, say, relating to authority or otherwise, when you've signed this arbitration agreement. But um, that error uh, was relied on by the other party, and you cannot now try and distance yourself from it. So, you know, the court says the party that causes by its own act a breach of the arbitration agreement, arbitration law, or other law, cannot contradict itself when a second party has relied on this wrongful or behavior, behavior or act. Now, what's interesting is how the court reaches this conclusion, right? Because it, it, it starts by saying this comes an application of the universally recognized principle, then it links that principle first to Roman law, in the prohibition of contradicting contradiction to the detriment of a third party. Sharia law, because it's citing an ad, 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 adage after that, that is a Sharia law principle, the attempt by a party to abolish what it has self accomplished must be disregarded. And then expressly estoppel, and it transliterates the word estoppel into Arabic. And then it keeps referring to the word estoppel, and, and a couple of Egyptian decisions did that, but just the rule of estoppel sort of transliter transliterated. But what's interesting is the link, is the court recognizes that there is no express rule of estoppel under, under Egyptian law. But then it says, but Egyptian law allows me, in the absence of an express rule, to find inspiration in the general principle, well, first in customs, and if there is no custom, then in Sharia law, and if there is no Sharia, then in, in natural justice and rules of equity. And from those sources of law finds that the principle of estoppel fits within the Egyptian legal system, and then gives the conditions under which it will apply. And that's why, because this is not the first decision that did that, but it's the first one that actually gave the conditions for estoppel to apply. And that's why, to me, it fits the the, the sort of the conditions for um, cross-pollination as opposed to acculturation, because uh, it said, you know, there has to be inconsistent conduct, inconsistent conduct has to have been relied on, and there has to be detriment. So it sort of understood the concept of estoppel properly, tried to link it to the other sort of principles and processes of Egyptian law, and not just put it in there and, and you know, let the parties figure it out. Um, so that's that, that's an, an interesting example to me of, of, of cross pollination. Uh, other sometimes it's not through the courts, sometimes it's just through the practice. Where, where, where the courts don't catch up, practice catches up. Now, force majeure is interesting. I mean, anecdotally, you had the Suez Canal crisis in the in the fifties, and and courts dealt with it differently from and as you know that meant that the Suez Canal was blocked and shippers, so say shipping tea or something from India to to um, England had to go around Africa as opposed to as opposed to passing through the Suez Canal and the Red Sea. Uh, that, of course, was almost impossible to achieve. Uh, no general doctrine of force majeure exists under English law. The threshold for frustration was not met. 
so English court just said, well, figure it out, you have to enforce the contract. And conversely, around the same time, French court uh, said, well, no, that's a force majeure, you're, you're, you're relieved of your obligation to, to perform. Um, post two ways, you've had a prof- proliferation of English arbitrations relating to some more sophisticated force majeure clauses, and then the evolution continued. But what's notable is that the practice in common law jurisdictions in drafting force majeure clause, it almost mimics naturally the conditions for force majeure as they exist in French law and many other civil law jurisdictions. Right? So that's that's cross pollination almost through practice rather than through sort of court uh, normative action. Um, third party rights is another example. For the longest time, for about a century. Before 1861, there were some earlier sort of origins for third parties to be able to enforce rights under a contract to which they're not a party. Uh, but from 1861, since the reform, reform of the sort of concept of consideration under English law, all the way up to 1999, so more than a century, there was very limited scope, almost inexistent scope for a third party to enforce any right, procedures or arbitration agreements or otherwise under a, under a contract. And um, and then you got the third party rights form, uh, and in the law reforms you have uh, expressed reference to the fact that one of the reasons, a further, I'm reading now from the report, a further factor in support of reforming the third party rule of English law is the fact that the legal systems of most of member states of the European Union recognize and enforce the rights of third party beneficiaries under contract. In France, for example, general principle that contracts that affect only between parties to them is, qual- is qualified by Article 1121. There's an old article in French Civil Code on the stipulation, stipulation, of property, stipulation to the benefit of others. Um, interestingly, in that same statute, in the Right of Third Parties Act, you have an express provision that says that the third party is bound by and is able to enforce the arbitration agreement that might exist in the contract under which that third party has rights um, in enforcing those rights. And and that that's essentially the same solution that French law had arrived at independently um, with respect to arbitration agreements and the relationship with third party beneficiaries for a stipulation for, to the benefit of others. Um, and, and, and this sort of, and again, this is cross pollination rather than acculturation because the, the rule is understood in all of its ramifications, is brought into the system and made to fit with the other parts of that system. Um, and, and, I mean, now, uh, now that the UK is no longer a member state, I very much doubt that that rule will change, uh, even if it was justified by the, you know, in part by the by the rules of other member states, and 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 that in part because the rule has harmoniously fit within the within the legal system that incorporated. Um, now, the the next sort of example is the uniform construction, right? So that I'm going to go rather quickly on, but it's again useful that it arises in the context of arbitration. So you have the seminal Fiona Trust case in in um, in the UK, where you have both Lord Hope and Lord Hoffman speeches on the rule um, that arbitration clauses are to be construed in a common sense way, and 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 without stopping at things like the difference between arising under or, or in connection therewith. Uh, both of them reference the German approach adopted by the German courts years earlier in the 70s. Um, similarly, you have a, well, as, as some of you may know, French courts in 2000 and, and, and in the early 2005, 2006 adopted a rule by which French courts are allowed to act in support of an arbitration, not seated in France, by appointing an arbitrator in the of party that is defaulting. Um, or that has, has refused to appoint an arbitrator, um, if there is some connection to France, however tenuous, sort of on the basis of, of, of universal uh, right of universal jurisdiction, essentially, it's not really universal jurisdiction, but quasi-universal jurisdiction. And, and you have the Singapore courts, a few years later, doing the same, or well, a decade later, doing the same by express reference to the French rule. And, and, and again, um, the way the court justifies why it's doing this and the reasoning and how it fits within the other parts of Singapore law is why this is in, you know, 
cross pollination as opposed to acculturation. So you have the court saying, although this reasoning emanated from a civil law jurisdiction and drew support from European human rights law, its fundamental logic appears to be sound and consistent with Singapore public policy. While it would not be open to a Singapore court to adopt wholesale the reasoning of the French courts, particular one based on European human rights law, I am of the view that such a decision could be justified either on the basis of contract law, Singapore contract law, or an exercise of the court's inherent jurisdiction to prevent injustice. So the concept is taken and it is sort of placed within the legal order of Singapore in, in, harmonious, in a harmonious fashion. Now that's the positive. <laughs> now let's take a quick look, uh, not so quick look, on the, on the negative. So on acculturation, on what I, examples of what I would call acculturation. Now that can happen in many ways, three ways that I would like to highlight. I think we're only going to have a chance to get through two of them is acculturation as a myopic application of the applicable law. And by that, I mean, when essentially the tribunal applying the applicable law reads it through its own legal culture or as confusion of, of, of foreign legal concepts. Now, myopic application. This is essentially where you have a sort of common law trained tribunal applying civil law as if it was English law, or a civil law tribunal applying English law as if it was French law or some other civil law. Now, um, what, what sort of, and you can see this at very many levels of abstraction, right? But if you take the first most abstract level, uh, there is a, at least stereotypically uh, speaking, there's a difference in approach to con legal construction between, say, uh, the civil law system that adopts a quasi-subjective, is not really subjective, but a quasi-subjective approach to interpretation where the actual goal is the intent of the party, is ascertaining the common intention of the parties. And the language of the context is just one important, but just one of the elements you take into account to ascertain that, that uh, that intention um, and the more objective English law approach that is just about construing the objective uh, meaning of, of the terms um, and what they reasonably mean. But ultimately your, your, your sort of four corners of the contract are your beginning and end. Uh, that is, I think, a vulgarization of both approaches, to be honest, but it's a useful proxy for the actual two approaches. And, and there are consequences to that philosophical difference, right? You have the parole evidence rule applied in, in, in common law, but not civil law systems. You have subsequent conduct used as an interpretive tool in civil law, but not in common law systems. And, and then you have tribunals. And trouble comes when you get a civil law tribunal refusing to accept that this is English law and that when you apply it, you have to forget your reflexes and adopt the reflexes of the applicable law. Because it's not just applying the rule, it's how you apply it that, that makes that, that, that sort of makes the difference. Um, or, the, or, or the reverse, where you have a sort of a common law tribunal applying civil law, but still refusing to, to, to sort of switch gears philosophically and how they approach the relevant norm, contract or otherwise, as before. As going down the level of abstraction, something a bit more concrete, it sometimes manifests this myopic application of the applicable law in, in the reluctance to apply certain concepts from the applicable law. Good faith, which you, you would have heard an interesting discussion this morning, uh, is, is, is a good example. Uh, famously, uh, or infamously, English law does not recognize a general doctrine of good faith. That's not me speaking, that's the English court speaking. And I'm quoting, and such term is unlikely to arise by way of necessary implication in a contract between two sophisticated commercial parties negotiating at arm's length. In other words, there is no general duty, statutory or otherwise, of, of good faith. And it's not an, a term that one implies by necessity in all contracts. Some contracts under English law, this would have been found to arise in them, let's say long-term joint ventures, partnership agreements. But um, despite that, you get, oft well, not often, luckily, but sometimes you will get a tribunal applying this law, but it's not from an English law background, so say a civil law tribunal. And so you have a hypothetical award here, well, it's anonymous awards rather than hypothetical, in which a tribunal constituted of, of, of civil law practitioners applying uh, an English law contract and deciding on termination under it, 
And you have the tribunal saying that the termination breached the implied obligation of good faith under the agreement. But no such one exists, right? And that's the that's the myopic application of the law. And, and the problem with that is not necessarily the, just the fact that the rule is wrong, right? There is no implied duty of good faith or that there is one. The problem is much more systemic because, uh, and, and the issue with acculturation generally, as opposed to cross-pollination. It's not that particular rule, good or bad, is being imported or not. The problem is each legal system has its own ecosystem. It is the very illustration of the whole being bigger than the sum of its parts. Um, it's not just a collection of rules. It's how these rules interact together. And they're usually, when the system is well designed, they tend to be, um, complementary to one another. So the objective interpretation rule is actually philosophically somewhat linked to the lack of duty of good faith, general duty of good faith, itself somewhat linked to, say, liquidated damages being enforceable as per their terms, regardless of actual loss and without possibility to moderate them if they're not penal and, and so on. And conversely, civil law system has its own sort of equilibrium and justice and, and, and genius. And, 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 it, and you disrupt that if you take one part of it, but not the other. The, the quasi-subjective, quasi-objective approach to interpretation together with the general duty of good faith and what it entails in terms of added obligations of the contract, together with the possibility to have a penal clause, but one that you can moderate. It all fits together as a whole. And the real problem comes not from one rule, but comes when you take one of those rules away or add to it without seeing how it fits with the rest. Now, another example is, say, just complete disregard of formal requirements under the applicable law. So it works both ways, not just a civil law tribunal disregarding English law, you also have English law tribunal disregarding civil law. So that's an example of, uh, in Qatar, some other uh, civil law jurisdiction, especially in the MENA region, there is a requirement that comes originally from French law, but that French law has since uh, let go, and, and and but still pretty much solidly part of the laws of the region, is that you cannot terminate a contract without going to court. And the only way to do that without going to court is to have an explicit, not just clear, but an explicit, essentially, rule, clause on the contract allowing you to do so. And you have plenty of cases. So in that case, for example, you have a case expressly just saying the mere existence of a clause in the contract that says you can terminate without breach or without without in case of breach uh, full stop doesn't mean that you can do so without a uh, court order that just means you can terminate uh, and the judge will then have to order termination it doesn't become a question of discretion but you still have to ask, to ask it from the judge unless the contract says you do not have to go ask it from the judge so the tribunal in that case english law trained looks at this and says, yeah, OK, I see that the court says that, but be that as it may, I look at the agreement and, and it uh, categorically and clearly provides that you can, you, know, you don't have to uh, go to a court because it says you can terminate by notice. That's clear enough. But that's not how the local courts have consistently applied it, right? And, and, and again, there is an equilibrium to the system. It may be one you don't like. I personally find this rule rather odd, but it is there. And as long as it is there, one has to follow it because, again, there is an equilibrium to it. So the consequences of termination under those particular jurisdictions are much more drastic. There is a presumption of retroactivity, for example, that does not exist under English law or even under French law in most cases. So, again, it's not a particular rule. It's the whole ecosystem that gets disrupted when these things happen. Now, it's not always a problem of tribunals. In fact, most of the time it's not. Most of the time it's counsel. Uh, that creates this alteration. And now let's get to examples of acculturation through acts of counsel, not acts of, of decision makers. Now, this happens when you get a contract drafted either with a sort of civil law background, but then subjected to English law or frequently, to be honest, in practice, much more frequently drafted with a common law mentality, but then subjected to a civilian legal system. Uh, and that arises in its disruptive effect, right? Because you have... Um, Parties thinking they're saying one thing and they're agreeing one thing, but then end up having end up the consequence that the contract meaning something else because of the applicable law. Let's take consequential loss. 
So typically, you'd have a, an exclusion of, of uh, damages or liability that says that the defaulting party will not have to pay consequential loss. Right? But what does that mean? If you take it as just plain English, you might think consequential loss means indirect losses. And that means something under a civil law. So let's say this is a contract governed by French law. Right? Indirect losses are something else. And they're not usually recoverable anyway. Um, but if you take it in the legal jargon sense, this not being a French law term, but an English law term, and what it means under English law, it may very well exclude lost profits, even some of the direct lost profits. And you know you have Hadley and Baxendale on that. And, and that becomes a much bigger problem, because if the parties didn't mean to exclude lost profits when they referred to consequential loss, because they were not referring to it in the English law sense, um, then that becomes, uh, you know, uh, and they end up with an exclusion of lost profits. That's a massive disruption to the economic bargain that's at stake here. And, and that happens, I mean, it can happen the reverse. So it, the, the, the sort of things that sound similar but are not the same is a typical problem in these sort of template contracts, or not even template, ones drafted with certain legal culture in mind that then gets in clash with the applicable law uh, coming from a different culture. And that can have massive economic consequences. Liquidated damages and close penal is another one. Typically, this would come in the form of, say, a take or pay provision in a commodity sale agreement where the seller will provide goods of a certain quantity every month. The buyer has to either take them and pay for them or pay for them anyway, even if they don't take them, or at least 95% of them, so whatever percentage. This essentially is there to ensure the seller constant stream of revenue per month or per year or whatever, per quarter for the duration of the contract, regardless of whether the buyer ends up buying it or not. Now, let's say you subject this to French law, or to Marathi law, or Egyptian law, or some other civilian legal system. Right? Um, well, uh, this usually comes in the form of like, oh, does, does, does French law recognize liquidated damages, close penal? Yes, it does. But are they the same thing, whether philosophically or in practice? They're not. There are ways. If the point is to ensure a constant stream of revenue to the seller, there are means within the French legal system or some other civil law legal system to ensure that other than a close penal. Close penal is not made for that. Whereas a liquidated damages clause in an English law contract is very well <laughs> designed for that as well. Um, so that sort of these things that sound similar but are not exactly the same cause a lot of these problems. So under English law, uh, an LD is, is what well, the first question you ask yourself is penal or not. And it's almost never penal. Like for it to be pen a penalty, it has to be, uh, it used to be that it needed to have uh, not, a pre not a genuine pre-estimate of loss. It's the Dunlop uh, precedent, but that has evolved into a new test where essentially, even if it is not a genuine pre-estimate of the loss, it's not penal. Uh, unless it has no commercial justification other than to, to deter breach. So the only thing really that English law cares about precluding is, deter, is that it's designed to deter breach. Once it's not that, then it's valid and you enforce it as it is. The civil law approach in France, in the Middle East, uh, Latin America, rest of Europe, it's, it's, it's very different. It's, it can be penal. It's, it's called penal. It's a penalty. It's fine for it to be a penalty. It doesn't become void. But, and that's why I'm saying it's an ecosystem, I'm allowing it to be a penalty, but I can moderate it if it's excessive or too little, right? Um, and under French law, for example, you can't change that. You can't provide in the contract that, you know, a, a contrary agreement. Now, in the common law world, in English law, it's the exact opposite. The whole system is designed so that proof of actual loss does not matter. They have MSC Mediterranean. The purpose and effect of a liquidated damages clause is to make proof of the claimant's actual loss unnecessary and irrelevant. Even if there are zero losses, you still get to take your money, as the seller in our example. Whereas under civil law, we saw the French article, but you also have, say, the Egyptian civil code that tells you that if you can establish that the creditor suffered no loss, you pay nothing. Uh, and that, of course, disrupts very much the the the, the if that was the bargain that was intended in the story, that very much disrupt that unnecessarily, because there are concepts, there are concepts of alternative obligations, there are concepts that allow you to reach that result differently. 
Uh, fraud. Fraud is another very sort of typical example of, 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 of that uh, because fraud, well, let's start from a, an example of a clause. We have a clause, an indemnity provision that's very important in some agreement. Imagine you have a well services agreement or something like that where indemnity can be in the billions of dollars. And you carve out from the indemnity fraud. Um, now, whether this exclusion is this big or that big will depend on the concept of fraud is this big or that big. Problem is, if you're drafting this, say, with an English law background, you're thinking you're having tiny carve to your indemnity clause. But then you apply UEE law, for example. Well, under UEE law, fraud is much bigger than it is under English law. So you, you end up with a carve that's much bigger. And again, if that's, there are ways to have achieved the economic bargain anyway under either system. The problem here comes from thinking two concepts are equivalent when they're really not. Uh, you know, because say fraud under English law requires an, in, you know, you, ne you need to be making a statement or, or equivalent that you know the other party will rely on. The intent is for the other party to rely on. No such requirement is necessary under, say, the Marathi law. Therefore, you may end up with a much bigger exclusion. Uh, so again, see, it's a, it's, it's a concept that is incorporated, but without due regard to A, how, what it means in its original ecosystem, and how it fits with the importing ecosystem. Uh, and let me finish on this, because I don't want to exceed my time. Um, that can happen not just in civil law, common law divide, and that's why I want to finish on, on, on something that is sort of, you can have, it's, it's a problem of approach, because you can have that problem even within the civil law. Mitigation is a very good example. You can have a contract, say, drafted with a French law mentality, or drafted with an Egyptian law mentality but subjected to uh, French law or Egyptian law, respectively, thinking that the same French law as Egyptian law is copied from French law anyway, it must be the same, and therefore it's not going to be an issue. But, and therefore, for example, you don't provide for any contractual duty to mitigate because you, even though you want it, but thinking you're from an Egyptian law background, thinking, well, there is a duty to mitigate under the law anyway, but French law doesn't have it. Whether pre-reform in 2016 or post-reform 2016, there is no general duty to mitigate under French law. Whereas under Egyptian law, loss is only recoverable if you could not have avoided it. Therefore, if you didn't, you know, if you tried and failed to mitigate it. Um, so that just shows you that the, the acculturation can happen even within subcultures of, a, of one culture, right? Um, and it brings me to my final point, and I'm going to skip the, the, the disruptive impact of the applicable law, say, through things like hardship. You would have heard an excellent presentation on that already anyway, a debate I mean on that already anyway. But my final point is, is, is one um, of approach, really. And it cannot stress uh, enough that the issue is never the wisdom of a particular rule. The issue is always how to legal orders, how two cultures, how two ecosystems can be made to fit with one another, but that only happens on the dual condition that one preserves the conceptual integrity of the imported concept or process and import it in a way that's the second condition that respects the existing, the other existent principles, philosophical approaches and processes of the importing system. Uh, and that happens whether in civil law, whether in common law, it happens, of course, more often in different cultures, but even within the same culture, it can happen. Uh, and with that, I um, thank you very much for your attention, and uh, hopefully I'll, I'll see you all in person uh, soon. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Shalbaya. It was an amazing uh, keynote speech and an amazing way to end the first day of the 8th Harvard International Arbitration Conference. Uh, this is it uh, for today. We will get back uh, here uh, tomorrow at, a at 9 a.m. You will receive a link with the instructions uh, to the uh, panel tomorrow. So that's it for today. Thank you very much, everyone, for your participation. And we hope to see you tomorrow again. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.